Okay, well, uh, welcome to the Hovercraft Great Britain's tech talk on uh, quiet hovercraft for the recipe. Uh, in other words, I'm going to tell you how to build a, a quiet hovercraft and the, all the things we've learned about that. Now, quiet and hovercraft are not two words that normally go together. Um, those of you who can remember back uh, to the good old days, uh, you standing in Dover, anywhere in Dover, you knew exactly when the SRN4s came in and out because you could hear them all over the town. Um, so to actually achieve a quiet hovercraft uh, is something of a, a, a first. So what do I mean by a quiet hovercraft? Well, my definition um, is a craft that meets the noise limits set by the EU directive for recreational boats. So in other words, if it's as quiet as a boat, what's the argument? Now, it, it is a point that air cushion vehicles are exempt. I think it's paragraph four or something um, from this EU directive. But unfortunately, you get harbour masters who haven't heard that, haven't read as far as paragraph four, uh, and they'll use it as an excuse um, to, to uh, keep you out. So uh, the idea that uh, we're, well, we're as quiet as a boat, we can prove it, um, it has some appeal. Now, what do we, how quiet do we mean? Well, one example, the one that I'm targeting at, is 72 dBA at 25 meters on full power. It has to be on full power. The standard is on full power. Um, if you, you, you can always make the argument, well, on cruising power, I'm 10 dBs less than that. Yeah, of course you are. But what do you define as cruising power? And sooner or later, you're going to need a burst of full power to get up that slipway or something. So that's when they're going to, um, you know, shout at you. So that's the um, the, the standard, and that's the, that. Those numbers, in fact, are the standard for uh, a craft up to 53 brake horsepower. There are other numbers for a more powerful craft. All right. Well, as I say. I personally have been kicking around the, the idea of how to make a quiet craft for about 40 years. Um, and the, the great thing is that they do now exist. We've got three of them. Now, just to give you an example, over on the left there, sat on the mud of the Medway Estuary, you've got uh, some fairly ordinary hovercraft, shall we say, typical cruising craft. On the right there, you've got my son uh, and his wife enjoying a run out in my craft. Um, and it's that craft that we've used as a test vehicle um, to research how to make craft quieter. Um, so if um, I play, the first noise you're going to hear is the 83 dBA or so, fairly classic cruiser, and it can be all sorts of different cruisers, but that sort of uh, power. And then after a few seconds, you'll hear my craft, just for comparison. Okay, so what you heard there was was 12 dBA. That's that's the reduction, um, and it's on a craft that's got the same, possibly I'd argue slightly better uh, carrying capacity, performance, etc., um, and the same engine certainly uh, as the classic standard uh, cruising craft. Um, both of these numbers, of course, are way way less than our friends in the racing community. Um, and uh, although the limit there for hovercraft uh, is 96 dBA, uh, there are very many F1s and a few F2s that are above that. So just for contrast, I'm going to play you uh, a 99 dBA craft. Do watch your ears, watch your speakers. Um, if you've got this in your earpiece, you might want to just uh, be careful. <laughs> Okay, so you know, go to a race meeting. It's loads of those that you're generally going to hear, not um, uh, the 71 dBA, roughly 30 dBA quieter uh, craft that uh, we've now worked out how to make. Right. So how do we do it? How do we how do we achieve this quiet hovercraft? Well, the key thing is you need measurement techniques, and you've got to use them to identify where the noise sources are, and there might be a dozen or more on any given craft. Um, and you've got to identify those sources, work out what you do, learn the lessons about um, how you fix each of these sources. And I'm sorry, it is a one by one uh, process. And then you've got to apply all the lessons, um, all the lessons. Uh, can I stress that? Not just change the fan. 
Uh, and when you've done all of that, well, you've got the recipe. You've got the recipe for making a quiet hovercraft, and it's that recipe that I want to share with you in this presentation. All right, well, technique number one, it's been around since the early 70s. Uh, you measure the DBA reading with uh, a meter like this. Um, at 25 meters, uh, at full power, please, not half power, um, at eight points around the craft like that, and just a word about taking those measurements you'll find that the meter goes up and down it, it, it the noise level actually waves up and down a few dbs at any of the stations that you go around the craft at put your meter on the slow scale that will leverage out, out a bit but also for really good quality uh, readings i tend to take three readings over a period of 10 20 seconds and then literally arithmetically average it um now you only average the seven positions you don't average or don't include in your averaging the rear behind the craft because if you notice behind my craft um it's a, it's 60 it's uh, about 10 dbs quieter than uh, all the other points around the craft there's a big technical reason for that uh it's called the, the zone of silence or cone of silence it's it's all well written up for uh, jet engines and so on uh, from the early 50s and i'm not going to go into it now because even i can't remember the maths involved all right so the first thing we need to look at is this measure this measurement of dba dba a refers to a weighting curve that um, is applied to the, the readings basically what it says is the human ear me you we all hate high frequency noise that's the one that annoys us most we're not so worried about low frequency noise so what the dba curve tries to do is to discount the lower frequencies um it says well we're not so worried about a frequency for example if you look at that curve at 100 hertz hertz is across the bottom there um it's about minus 20 dbs down just under minus 20 dbs down um on what it would be at a, a thousand hertz 1k there um now that's a, a, a trick that's useful to us if we can do everything we can to reduce the frequency of noise that we're generating from our craft then we're going to get a better score um now the that what that tends to do is to argue for the use of um four stroke low revving four stroke engines not screaming two strokes sorry but screaming two strokes tend to annoy the DBA meter by their very uh, nature because they're high frequency. They're jet engine type frequencies. All right. Well, uh, having said that, one of the second techniques that we can use is frequency analysis. We can look at the noise uh, of the uh, of the craft and say, what are the components of that noise? Um, and what you see there is a comparison between the blue line, which is a, a classic um, cruising craft, and the pinky line underneath it, um, which is my craft Q1. Now, okay, you can see that the two lines um, are separated. There's a there's a, a reduction in Q uh, in the Q1 case of around 10 dBs in the broadband noise at the higher frequencies. But the real message I want to get to you here is look at those spikes sticking upwards particularly that one to the left there about 300 hertz sticking up as far as 80 db a that's the fan frequency is the frequency at which the blade goes round on that craft and that's what's annoying the noise meter but this curve is weighted to uh, allow for that dba weighting curve so that uh, flan blade passing frequency as we call it is the one that's annoying the meter most and those uh, other peaks to the right, those other spikes to the right, are multiples of that, the so-called harmonics. So we can use frequency analysis to work out what the key noises are. So don't forget that was our comparison between uh the blue line the first uh, part noise and the pinky line which was the second noise mycraft okay um so what 
having done all this analysis, and a lot of this work was done back in the 80s, uh, one of the uh, main concerns, well, it's the uh, engine firing frequency, the number of bangs, the number of times the engine fires per second, the number of bangs per second, uh, and it's the fan blade passing frequency, the number of times a fan blade passes any point around the, around the curve per second. And in both cases, it's often the harmonics, the whole number multiples of that basic frequency that does the damage because it's higher up that DVA curve. People say, wow, that's a shrill jet engine noise rather than a deep hum. OK, uh, what's causing that noise? Well, blindingly obvious uh, engine exhaust and air intakes. Don't forget the air intake. There's pulsing of air coming in and out of that and that make a lot of noise. And uh, fan turbulence caused by obstructions. We have, for very, very good engineering reasons, for 50 years, we put struts, belts, pulleys, uh, splitters, flow straighteners, all sorts of things, very close to the fan, because that's good engineering support. Um, however, the closer it is to the fan, the more noise it makes, because those obstructions cause a, a vortex of fan turbulence uh, behind them or in front of them, um, and as the blade cuts through these vortices, the blade basically produces a banging noise. And, and that's what you're hearing. You're hearing loads of bangs every second uh, caused by these interruptions to the clean airflow. This is the third management technique. Uh, and you'll see straight away uh, that I've borrowed this slide from somebody far more expert. And you'll be pleased to know I am not going to go through it. I've put it there for completeness. Anybody who wants to talk about it offline um, later or in the Q&A session in the Zoom later this week, uh, please uh, uh, do go have a go. But really what I'm talking about is a, a well-known uh, technique. Some call it the acoustic camera. It's a way of locating noise sources. And the way it works is essentially if I've got a noise coming in from one side here, it's going to reach this ear before it reaches that ear. The brain has learned over the years that that little bit of delay, it can compute where the noise is coming from. So I know the noise comes from over there. Um, now, substitute a computer for the brain and 16 microphones in my case uh, for two ears. And you get a mechanism which basically will locate a noise to within perhaps four inches or so, something like that. Um, and you can also tune it to individual frequencies. So you can be looking for a specific perhaps engine noise or a fan noise. So this is the system I made back in 2007. Um, noise cam, I called it, uh, enabled us to see sound. So there's Tony Broad's F3 craft under the array. The 16 microns are those little black blobs around the um, uh, curve there. Um, so we drove the craft in underneath, held it down, revved it up to full power, uh, took a few pictures and one of the pictures is on the left there. It's a big red splodge on the exhaust uh, at the engine firing frequency. Well, actually at half the engine firing frequency. And that became typical of all TZR craft at the time. Uh, this is, as I say, about 13 years ago now, um, that they would all show uh, a, a loud noise um, coming out of the exhaust. And that was by far and away the loudest noise. So I think as Reg Turnbull came up with a much better silencer, which fairly quickly became fairly universal across the uh, TZR powered fleet. And as a result, most of them came down from typically 95 dBA to, to 85 dBA. Um, so that was a quick win, uh, an early win, because there was one particular source that was really much louder than anything else. Not as good as that on most craft. Usually you've got lots of sources. So here's a, a typical analysis, um, uh, an integrated craft uh, with, I think, a 503 engine. I'll be told that's probably something else. But anyway, um, it's the analysis of this craft found three basic sources. The engine firing frequency came up twice. Uh, on the left there, you've got a picture which pretty well tallies to the air intake. Um, there's no silencer fitted to that. It's straight foam filter, as is classic on a racing craft. Um, so all the pulses of air going in um, there are 
basically making a big noise. Uh, and in fact, it's the loudest noise on this particular craft. On the right there, you can see the noise coming out of the exhaust. Again, an engine frequency. Lower down, you'll see the uh, on the right hand side of that picture, there's a big splodge that corresponds to the splitter plate. And that's where uh, the splitter, the, the fan is too close to the splitter and uh, the splitter is, is a flat i'll come the splitter i'll come on to that later on um and that causes noise there's a much smaller noise off to the left hand side and it's not clear whether that's the uh second the other side of the splitter in, uh, making a noise or it's um noise from the uh, turbulence generated behind that big radiator that you can see in front of the fan and you'll say well it's not behind the radiator well that's one of the key messages um the air is swirling as it goes into the fan and it swirls very much so as it comes out of the fan uh, so uh, very often the source appears to be around the swirl i.e the way the arrow is pointed from where it really is um, so that brings us on to this uh, one um, here we had a um, a very strong signal from the left hand side of the splitter as you look from the front um, and again that's associated with the interference between the um, blade and the flat splitter plate there's a bunch of turbulence there that occurs every time a blade goes past that's a bang multiply those bangs up on the number of the seconds and that's your, your blade passing frequency and that's what we're seeing in this picture what was the lesson out of that well it, it really these flat plate splitters ignore the way the airflow is really going the air is swirling it's um, going around somewhat in the direction of the fan possibly as, as much as 45 degrees to the actual direction uh, you know straight fore and aft um so really those splitter plates ought to be curled and they should um, curl up one side, curl down the other, so that they meet the airflow, the actual airflow from the fan, not the, the one we all think it is. Um, there's another lesson as well in that um, I much prefer an A-shaped splitter, a splitter that isn't flat across like uh, we've got here, um, but goes up to the fan hub, um, because that cuts out a, a source of turbulence that we've found as well. But again, um, I, I haven't got time to go into that now. I can take that offline if anybody's really interested in that particular topic. Um, flow straighteners were a great source of noise early on. Um, you can see what three or more splodges here, which are pretty well associated with the flow straighteners, particularly if you allow for the fact that the, uh, the fan swirl, in this case, is the other way around. Um, the lesson from this, well, the flow straighteners need to be not hard up against the fan trailing edge. They need to be stepped back four inches, uh, 100 mil, something like that. A lot of people have done that, including some leading Formula One people, and it hasn't affected their performance at all. In fact, debatably, um, by getting rid of turbulence, I mean, turbulence, after all, is a noise source, which is what I'm worrying about. But it is a piece of inefficiency. Your airflow is not going as cleanly as it might. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to claim more than perhaps a 1% improvement in thrust, something you couldn't measure. But um, it, it, is it is certainly an inefficiency. So put your flow straighteners further back, was the message. All right, well, another good source of noise that we found was um, pulleys sat often in a cutout uh, at the uh, base of the duct right in front of the fan to get the, the belt as close to the fan as possible good engineering reasons why you want to do that but from a noise perspective it is a, a good way of causing turbulence and a good way of making noise you can see here again there's a, a smaller piece of um, noise round to the left a little bit where the swirl has taken the turbulence that originally generated by the pulley in front of the fan round behind the fan uh, then swirled around a bit and it's hit the next flow straightener and that's caused a, uh, a noise there as well <coughs> uh, well the big guys aren't um, exempt um, it was quite fun trying to get my noise array designed for a uh, small sports craft onto the top of uh, a griffin uh, td2000 but we did manage it with a load of rope 
Um, and here you can see that there's a very distinct uh, noise coming from behind the pylon, the uh, there that's supporting the fan. Um, it's at three times the blade rotation frequency and it is kicked to the left. It's angled to the left because that's the way the swirl took it round. Um, what's the message out of this? Well, if you're going to use pylons and things like it, uh, they've got to be some kind of aerofoil shape and actually not just a straight aerofoil because I've seen lots of craft with a straight aerofoil hard up against the fan, ignoring the fact that, again, there's this swirl thing and actually the air is going across that airfoil. Really, that airfoil is a stalled wing. Think of it in that direction. It has to be curved in some way um, so that it's reflecting the way the air is actually going at that point. Otherwise, um, it's going to make turbulence. That's a noise source for me. It's also inefficiency for your airflow. All right, well, we took this system worldwide, uh, including in uh, 2009, I think, to the States. Um, here's uh, a well-known uh, craft under the array, uh, the only one that ever reversed in under the way, uh, array using the reversing buckets there. You can see me peering into the uh, laptop computer trying to drive it all over on the left there. Um, I'm trying to see in bright American sunshine um, what, uh, what is going on. But from that survey really of, of uh, craft worldwide, we got a very, very good picture of what makes the noise, um, what the problems are. And to a large extent, we haven't had the array out for the last few years because in a way, uh, its job was done. We knew, we know what the sources are. The issue is, what do you do about it? Um, and that's where the challenges start. A uh, little byproduct of the system. Sometimes we saw noises we didn't expect to see. Uh, the World Championships in Sweden a few years back, uh, classic um, Dutch uh, craft here showed the air intake noise in that left hand picture just where we expected it to be. But there was a funny noise, uh, an engine related noise um, on the crankshaft basically. Don't normally see that. We don't see crankshaft noise uh, at all. Uh, but on this craft we did. Uh, told the owner the following day, I think the crankshaft, I can't remember if it actually snapped or the bearings failed, but anyway, there was a, it was a precursor of a major failure. Uh, and actually this non-destructive testing, as it's called, um, is used by the top end car manufacturers, um, uh, I believe, at the end of their production lines. All right, well, this is the big picture uh, and it's an obvious one, but it needs saying, the more horsepower you've got, the more noise you're gonna make. Um, and it's not just the engine, it's the fan as well. The fan is making more noise as um, you put more horsepower into it. And if we look at that fan noise, there's, there's an interesting thing that comes out of it. If you look at those lines towards the bottom of the graph, as you increase the tip speed, the noise is getting louder. So that's your first message. Let's try and reduce the tip speed as much as we can. But those lines at the bottom are what multi-wing, the software, predicts is the noise. What I actually measure as fan noise are those little spots. Each of those is an individual craft that was measured. Um, and they're always noisier, perhaps 5, 15 dB, sometimes a bit more noisier than the theoretical lab conditions multi-wing figures. And the issue is, what is that noise, that, that excess noise above the fan? Uh, and I, the answer is, is turbulence, because and turbulence generated noise, because once um, we, we start to hack away at that, we've shown that the noise can come down and it's actually much closer to the multi-wing figures um, on, for example, my craft. My craft is only about uh, five dBs, four or five dBs above the multi-wing predicted figure. Uh, well, here's my craft. Uh, it's, uh, as you can see there, it has that sickle fan, the multi-wing 1W fan. It's a classic cooling fan, uh, just it, not one that's used generally in the hovercraft world. Um, the key to me is it's a wider cord. The front to back of the fan, as it were, uh, the width of the blade is um, much bigger than normal, perhaps twice as wide as normal. Um, that means it can do more work at a lower 
speed, a lower tip speed, and that makes it quieter. Simply working it at 80 meters per second instead of the classic 120, 160 meters per second makes the thing quieter. But it's also sickle shaped, it's got that curve shape, and that does play a role in reducing the higher frequency harmonics, the shrill noises that annoy people so much. I won't go into that here, that's a whole topic in its own right, but if you want to ask me questions on that in the uh, Q&A in the Zoom or online, please do. But the key message I want to make is, oh, sorry, uh, the next um, piece is, I did uh, do a bit of development of uh, the noise cam system and put a few more microphones on it and turned it into a 3D system and I did some tests here on my lawn at home of my test craft. And what that showed was that there were noise sources actually in the plenum behind the fan, in the lift area behind the fan. And what came out of that was, you know, we all talk about gas flowing an engine to make it better and more efficient. We need to gas flow the air uh, behind the fan. It's not a question of just dumping it in a box as we've classically done and it will work its own way out. You really need to think about how that airflow works. I would argue for a vertical splitter uh, that splits the air into left and right. Uh, they're becoming fairly common now, I think, on a lot of craft. Um, there's a lot of operational benefits in that, in getting a smooth, uh, better lift airflow. But it's also uh, sorting out these two big noise sources that we found uh, behind the fan. All right, well, Owen Ellis down in Oz um, has a brilliant design um, called the RevTech uh, rocket and in fact I think it's been making craft for about 20 years and they've all got this basic concept that um, the, there is nothing in front of the fan. I, from a noise perspective I love that and the uh, splitters and flow straighteners behind the fan are well um, shaped to uh, you know, reflect the real airflow not the oh it's all going straight back isn't it no it's swirling um the hub and the tail cone are nicely fared in so there's no noise uh, there's no turbulence and noise associated with that and the blades uh, run at a minimum tip clearance around about five mil i think uh to the fan and a constant consistent tip clearance all the way around it's no good having a three quarter inch gap uh behind the blade at one point because you, you really haven't got the ducks round or something like that that will make noise um one of the problems I've got is that uh, the various measurements I've seen of uh, Owen's craft um, or ones that he's sold over the years, uh, a lot of them I don't trust. Um, so the, the ones I'm going to quote here are a, a craft that was brought to um, the Worlds in Sweden that I measured a few years ago. It's a 503 power craft, so it's a little bit noisier than perhaps some of the four stroke power craft. Um, but I measured that at 85 dBA, which at the time was around about 7 dBA quieter than the average 503. So there's a lot of lessons airflow wise in this uh, craft that, that I'm, I'm learning from, I have learned. And I've incorporated those in my craft. You saw this picture earlier. Um, I want to explain, this is a 20 year old craft. It was originally built as an F25 for uh, Sun Simon. You know that guy who's uh, um racing around in f2 these days uh, well one of the first craft he had was this when he was about 13 or 14 um was this uh machine in an earlier incarnation with a, a, a 22 horsepower engine in it um since then i've used it uh, as a test hack um so i've done collaborations with vortex for a few years and then with flying fish and each of those successive collaborations has inched our understanding of the noise down and uh, onwards and uh, the, the noise level itself downwards. So uh, around about five years ago, um, we were able, with Fish's help, to get this craft down to a level where it met the gold standard, the EU boat standard, 72 dBA. Um, in fact, some of the measurements average out at around uh, 70 to 71 dBA on that craft. Um, we did make a, a second test craft, um, a modified Marlin, uh, and that was also quiet. Um, we tried a number of things on that to, as it were, make it easier to make, and those things all made extra noises. So the message out of that was, you have to stick to the recipe. You, it's 
but you have to be very careful about taking shortcuts on the recipe. Uh, there's now a third quiet craft, that's John Gifford's brilliant uh, three, four seat cruiser. You can see it here with uh, Rachel driving and Owen chatting away to John on board uh, on the Medway. Um, that has a 35 dB thrust engine, classic business time thrust engine, uh, and another 15, 20 horsepower, John will tell me, um, lift engine buried away under cover with a centrifugal fan. Um, interesting, when that first craft, when that craft first appeared, it measured around 78 dBA, and we all shook our heads. Uh, I did some measurements, and the exhaust turned out to be the question. Um, although it was a brilliant, big stainless steel silencer, it actually wasn't very efficient. So I stuck the cheapo um, Citroen C1 car silencer that I, I found works on it, and immediately we got below 72 dBA. So um, the message is you have to tick every box in the recipe. Um, if you take chances with any one of them, you get the wrong silencer in this case. Uh, even though it's a glossy silencer, it's not necessarily good enough. All right, this is the busiest slide I'm going to give you. Uh, I apologize for that, but I've tried to cram into one incredibly busy slide of the total recipe. Um, and don't forget, you can free frame this, you can read it at your leisure. It will eventually appear, the whole slide pack will appear on a website somewhere, and there'll probably make me a magazine article. Uh, well, there should be a magazine article. And of course, you can talk through uh, either in the text page below or at the Q&A session um, later this week on Zoom. All right, so you need, as I've said all the way along, you need to look at the exhaust and the intake and the silence, so you need to be good and efficient ones. Generally speaking, that means a reactive, a multi-chambered design, not one full of your roof insulation. Um, much the best answer is a four-stroke engine, low revving, for example, the Briggs and Stratton um, or the Cola at 3,600 RPM or thereabouts. Uh, if you hard mount it to the hull, you can transmit quite a lot of noise out through a vibrating hull, like a big microphone. So recommend en soft engine mountings, for example, something like Shaw 45. Those things are fairly straightforward, what to do with the engine. The real fun bit comes, how do you sort the fan out? Um, what I've done, is certainly I recommend low fan tip speed. 80 meters per second has worked three times now. Although John is using, is not using the multi-wing fan, he's using more uh, classic fan. Um, he's at 80 meters per second and he's still achieving the noise levels we want. We need a minimum and a uniform fan tip clearance, five millimeters say, all the way around. The flow straighteners need to be at least 100 millimeters, four inches back from the fan trailing edge. And here's the key bit. You need to gas flow. Think about the way the air is actually going. Use some tough tests, some string tests, some bits of wool stuck on tests. Understand where the air is going. If that piece of string is going forwards when it's supposed to be going backwards, you've got turbulence. So gas flow, the splitters and the ducting behind the fan, particularly if you've got an integrated craft, vertical central uh, splitter to separate the air from both down both sides of the craft. And as I keep saying, but it's worth repeating it, remember the air swirls in front of, as well as behind the fan. Put the splitter at least 50 mil back from the fan trailing edge. Mine is running at uh, 70 mil uh, gap. And the critical one, nothing in front of the fan for a minimum of 500 mil from the fan leading edge, something like uh, 18 inches from the fan leading edge. And that's the bit that is difficult to achieve. You, and, you know, the engineering solutions for that are uh, quite challenging. Well, let's go on to the first of the engineering solutions. This is the, the classic Owen Ellis rear drive. Um, it's worked on two craft now. Um, basically the sh shaft, uh, being shown in red there, bar a couple of uh, universal couplings, takes the drive from the engine to behind the fan and then the belt in green there goes up to the fan shaft and goes forward to the fan itself. Um, that way you've got a totally clean um, air intake. 
do remember however you need to move the engine forward it's no good putting it in the classic position i'll come on to that uh, the challenge for me because i'm not an, a mechanical engineer far from it is it needs engineering to get it light owen he's an aircraft engineer he's done a brilliant job with that uh, the two craft that uh, uh, i've been involved in uh, are both uh, pretty heavy in the uh, metalwork here uh, it's, it's a classic case i think of uh, somebody coming along with carbon fiber and uh, sort of a modern approach to life and really making it a lot lighter Uh, the second solution is John Gifford's solution, um, a long top shaft. The belt takes the drive up immediately behind the engine in a big engine bay in his case. And then there's a very long top shaft uh, to the fan. Uh, that shaft is supported behind the fan by um, the, the, the uh, flow straightener array. They act as uh, struts to support the back of the shaft there and hold the fan maybe you know maybe this works best on a larger craft it kind of takes up a lot of space um uh, I'm, I'm sure folk will come up with ways of using using it right both the two previous answers uh, the solutions we know where they work this one is we don't know if it works the jury is out um and that is that you move the engine forward but you use a drive shaft to a belt assembly that is just outside the fan duct, all right? It's just in front of the duct, not in the duct as we classically do it. Now that requires a longer top hub. Um, there's several ways of doing this, but one of them is a fixed uh, sh um, shaft uh, and a rotating hub, the classic solution, um, but a much longer hub, so it pushes the fan back. In that case, you're going to have to support the fixed hub, sorry, the fixed shaft, the red shaft there, behind the fan, stop it waving around. And again, the flow straighteners or the splitter assembly can help you support it there. Um, we've tested this uh, with just struts alone. We literally stuck the struts and the belts in front of my craft with a clean intake, and there was no increasing noise. But when we subsequently built a, a, a test craft and we put the engine in the classic position, i.e. much closer to the fan, then it was about 60 ABA noisier um, than, it, than my test craft. So Graham Nutt right now is building a craft with Bill Baker and uh, Rupert's uh, help, I think, which is going to test this sort of approach or something like it. And I'm, I, for one, am very uh, keen to see how um how well it performs noise wise i'm sure it'll work perfectly from a point of view of lots and lots of thrust and efficient and so on um but my 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 test criteria is how noisy is it <clears throat> all right well leaping into the future uh, the fourth engineering solution is you put the electric motor in the fan hub and this is what owen is doing and i'm hoping that one of the talks in this series will be from owen um talking about his experiments with electric uh, power um it's brilliant the electric motors that he's using are now available up to about 30 horsepower i think um and they will fit in the hub of the, of the fans we use um so we don't need drive shafts um they're very light a few kilos um so potentially we've got the cleanest airflow flow of all the solutions um plus we've got no engine noise there's no air in take to an engine and no exhaust to worry about um and actually we've got a bonus in terms of the weight of course that's counteracted by the batteries which of course we won't talk about here but um the possible downside and again the jury's out on this we're waiting for owen to get to a point where we can test it uh is that you have to uh, at the moment you, you the simplest way of doing it is you run the fan and it's usually uh a, 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 a small aircraft prop that's uh, fitted um you have to run it at, en at engine speed and the engine speeds that are available right now are 2000 rpm or more um and that tends to re result in a, a tip speed that i would regard as being a bit high um but jury out you know it, it, we might get away with a higher tip speed because we've got rid of all the obstruction turbulence problems let's wait and see but i, I for one i'm quite keen to get out to uh, 
Oz or Canada or wherever he's got the craft um, and uh, put, put a new version of my noise array that I'm building um, uh, around the craft and find out what's going on there. All right, so quite other craft. Let me tell you, I've been driving one now for about five years and so have others. It's a wonderful experience. Whereas I can hear a standard cruiser from a, over a mile away, uh, even before I can see it often in a river estuary, you can't hear this craft until it's about 100 yards, 200 yards away, depending on what power levels you're using. Uh, and of course, the key thing is for cruiser, you never drive around on full power. Uh, you're going to use it occasionally for getting up a slipway or something like that. Uh, I drive around typically on 2,500, 2,700 RPM. So there's a 95% reduction in the noise footprint. Straight out, you're annoying a much smaller area of people, shall we say, um, as you go out in the public. Other bonus, you can talk freely on board. Uh, you can just talk, chat to the... Um, but there is an interesting downside, and one I wouldn't have predicted. If there are other noises around, people don't hear you coming. After all, you know, if you're if if you're walking around on a slipway and perhaps there's a jet ski around doing donuts as they tend to do, um, and you're approaching uh, uh, with your quiet craft and perhaps you've got it throttled back, you're just carrying on on momentum, you're making about 60 dBA or something like that, they don't hear you. So I've had more than one occasion where I get close to the slipway and they have to abort my approach because people didn't get out of the way. Because of course hovercraft are noisy, they expect to be alerted. So here's an interesting one, you need a horn. I fitted a motorbike horn to my craft and we've actually tested it between two quiet craft and it is a, a good way of alerting people uh, that you're around. Okay, so finally, uh, they exist. We now know what the recipe is and I'm keen to share it with you. The challenge is to get more quiet craft into use uh, to encourage manufacturers. The Hobcraft Manufacturers Association has produced a, a Q standard that um, can be built to. Of course, right now we don't have a lot of um, buoyant manufacturers, uh, perhaps, um, but let's see. The key thing I'm wanting to support is supporting home builders, people that want to build their own quiet hovercraft at home, in their garages or, or whatever. This is really what I wanted to try and achieve. And I am very, very willing to give support. You can contact me um, on the email address below, or oh, sorry, on the website below, um, and, and that'll give you an email address. And I'm very keen to give support. I've only in this, even though this is a very long technical lecture, trust me, I've only skirted over the outlines. Uh, when you get into it, you're gonna need a degree of hand holding, and I'm very happy to provide that to the community free. This is, you know, open source. Okay, so uh, I've probably bored you to tears. Um, thank you very much indeed. Don't forget, uh, you can uh, put any questions to me on the uh, YouTube page below on the text questions, and you can also join in the Zoom. Um, interactive session later in the week and uh, I'm happy to take questions there. Thanks a lot. Thanks for watching.